In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Nancy Duarte. She has one of the largest design firms in Silicon Valley and has helped brands such as Google, GE, many more. She talks about some of the ups and downs and what worked, what didn't work on the entrepreneurial journey. That and much more coming up right now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I got Nancy Duarte early today where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Nancy Duarte. She's a communication expert. Hey, Nancy. Thanks for joining us. She's a communication expert who's been featured in, in Fortune, Forbes, Fast Company, many more. Her firm, Duarte Inc., is the largest design firm in Silicon Valley and has helped brands such as Google, GE, just to name a few. She's the author of three award-winning books, including Resonate, that spent nearly a year on Amazon's top 100 bestsellers list. And I went through it last night, probably at 2 a.m. Thanks for being here, Nancy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited because you're, you're one person who's really influenced my work, and I like to really include stories in my interviews and that's you're you're one of the inspirations behind that so thank you oh wow thanks jeremy and so i'm excited to hear your big lessons learned what inspires you to succeed and i always like to include a fun fact a uh, fun fact about nancy is she loves hedgehogs yeah i love hedgehogs <laughs> so tell tell us why um, i actually collect them i have little guys see my little guys here this one's a puppet this one's one of those little critters you see my little hedgehog <laughs> so um when I read uh, Jim Collins' Good to Great, rocked my world. In fact, uh, he says he has a hedgehog concept, and it's if there's one thing you can do and be passionate about and be best in the world at, do yeah. just that one thing. And that book came at a time when we were a, a generalist agency. We were doing print and web and multimedia and all that. And uh, what I did is I cut everything out, and then we just did presentations. Yeah. And um, I mean, we lost some people because some of my designers were like, I am not doing presentations. I only do print or whatever. And it was a big decision where we paid a price for it, but it's had a massive payoff. So I have a little thing for hedgehogs. They're illegal in California. So oh. I have a T-shirt, too, that says legalized hedgehogs. <laughs> I love it. And we'll yeah. get into some of those transformations and, you know, how you got to that one best thing in the world. Because I think that's key for any business. But I wanted to start with uh, what shaped you and what motivates you. What was your childhood like? It was, um, it was really difficult. Um, you know, I was raised in an economically and emotionally starved environment. And, um, and there's a whole lot of baggage that comes with that. You know, all the abuse, um, the neglect. Um, I didn't even talk till I was four years old. And then I obviously never top, stopped talking ever since then. Um, and then my mom left us when I was 16. She abandoned us. Wow. And I kind of took on leader of the household. So even though I was the third born kid, I, I you know, took over the house. You know, and then I, this was in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I went to a year of college and dropped out. And I got married instead. So I was married when I was 18. And... Uh, fortunately, I've still been married to Mark for 32 years. Congratulations. Um, but something happens. I don't know if it's just a woman and her mom, like that relationship. I All my life, it drove and drove and drove and drove. All I wanted to hear was from my mom was, I'm really proud of you. I'm really proud of you or something, you know. Um, and she didn't. Like, she's not read my book. She gets Amazon shipments like crazy all day long. And she reads them and stickers them and, you know. But she's never read my books, and so mm. it was. It was. It's been interesting though, because I think she, as she reaches end of life in the last two or three months, she's actually left me these beautiful voicemails, uh, about four of them that have in them everything I ever longed to hear from my mom. Mm. So it's really kind of cool, you know, to have some closure there. Mm. But that's what drove me. Oddly, is this hole in my heart. Yeah. this longing um, for affection from someone I may never get it from. And so what it did is it shaped me. It, it made me decide that I'm, 
what I'm not going to be. And it also helped me decide how to raise my own children because yeah. I knew what I didn't want. And it, and it also, I think I jumped into work as a bit of an escape yeah. uh, too. And, um, that's yeah, a lot of so. pressure, though, for someone who's that young. How did you, from a young age, get through that? Because some people go the, the other route is they pass that along, and you said to yourself, I'm going to do the opposite. Yeah, I, I don't know. I ask myself that all the time because there's four of us in the family, yeah. and I think maybe it's because we had each other. We came through stronger. I, I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> But I have this enormous sense of endurance now. I mean, I did things like I ran track and field. Because whenever my mom and dad would have these big, glorious scenes of violence, I would run out the front door and I would just run and run and run and run. And I'd run around my little elementary school several times until I just collapsed and cried, right? And you just deal with it different ways. And so I think I escaped through endurance you know, through these kind of endurance kind of sports. And so then, of course, you know, by the time I got into junior high and high school, I, I was a track. I could run track because yeah. I had to flee out my front wow. door so often. Yeah, so, that sounds really I, difficult. I, yeah, I think I think that there's coping mechanisms, but I also think it's like, hey, stuff happens, let's move on. I'm, I'm a really future-focused person. So some people are present past and some people are present future. And I'm almost future, future. Like I actually almost use obsessing about the future as a coping mechanism. So I'm constantly like, okay, what's going to be next? What do I have to do? Mm -hmm. What do I have to do to make sure all my employees are cared for? What do I have to do to make sure they can all make their car payments? What do I have to do so that, you know, I'm at the right place in the future as my customer needs change? What do I have to do? do? So I'm always kind of in the future. And I think that actually helps me because I don't dwell on the past at all. Like, like at all. It's hard to also when you're you're in that situation and you want to change it. Who is your inspiration or big influence growing up that you look to as a mentor to get through and to kind of get on the right path? Yeah, I had a few. I was involved in Young Life in junior high. I had neighbors that were always so concerned. But believe it or not, my dad traveled a lot when he worked. But my dad was a bit of a white knight in our house um, when my mom she was manic depressant when when she would go crazy he would grab us like he'd run through the house get in the car get in the car get you know we'd all dive bomb in the car and we'd peel out and be safe you know and so he you know he would pull me in his lap and or I would actually climb in my in his lap myself and uh, when I needed comfort when I needed affection I Mm. I knew how to get that from him so I was talking to my sisters and they're like what do you mean you sat in dad's lap and I'm like well I just climbed in it like I, he was a man you had to take from, but when you took from him, he delivered, right? And right. and and so he was kind of more, much more present, um, and and was an outlet for me. Yeah, I mean, you find some of the most successful people went through, I mean, for better intents and purposes, crap early on and yeah. fought through it and made you stronger. Um, what were the early days? I know you met your husband. You started in 1988 with the company. Um, what were the early days of the company like? <laughs> so my husband actually started it, 1988. He worked all summer long and uh, saved all his money moving furniture, and he bought a Mac Plus. And I wish it was light outside because, um, believe it or not, the building that he moved furniture from is a 35,000 square foot building that we currently rent. Is oh, that wow. the big thing? So it was exactly 25 years ago this summer. And so, um, so we bought a Mac Plus, and I uh, had a sales job here in the Valley, and I would come home, and he's like, no, I have this business idea. And I'm like, what a joke. This is stupid. What was his business idea? What this? was it? Duarte Design. Right, but you, it's changed, changed many times. What was that original concept? It was originally called Duarte Desktop Publishing and Graphic Design. Okay. So that's what it was. Yeah, he's a technical illustrator. He was a really great illustrator. He was a typesetter. And I just wanted, I was very pregnant and I just wanted him to get a real job. I'm like, you go get yourself a real job. <laughs> I'm sick of this. I mean, it was the most intense time of our marriage. We were married seven years. I was coming home, very pregnant, very pissed and just screaming, yelling and, you know, get a job, get a job. And then finally he just got really teary eyed. He said, this is a vision I have. He's like, why don't you just read Macworld magazine and you come back to me and you tell me that this personal computer thing is not going to be a really big thing. <laughs> so I was like, What's this personal computer thing? That's a toy. And uh, I read Macworld magazine. And uh, in one afternoon, I made phone calls and we won NASA tandem 
and Apple, a wow. whole division of Apple. And um, I never went back to work. So what did it. you say to those people? Were well, you just we like, it, you just like in the zone pregnant woman? Or what did you say to those people? <laughs> 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 I was just a piss pregnant woman and all the doubt. No, um, no it, what was cool is some people, you're too young to know, but what how you used to do things back then is you would use an X-Acto knife and black, electrical tape or rub on tape and rub on letters and that's the way you did things back then and so there were a lot of companies in these accounts who were doing things manually either inking or with this exacto knives cutting stuff up so we were kind of the young digital upstart right back then and we would go in and say you know we could do all this digitally like we um illustrated the back side of a bunch of old mainframes they would open up and show all the back planes and all that stuff and well, what we did is we, t we took a photo of it and traced over it digitally. And they were like, nobody's proposed that as a solution. Mm. This is amazing. I didn't, well, I wouldn't have known I could do that if I hadn't read Math World Magazine. The other thing is we didn't own a single thing. I didn't own a single one of those gadgets. But as I listened to their pain point, I listened to what kind of projects they may have. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we got oh this technology. We've got it all, you know. And then we had to run out and buy it when we won these accounts and stuff. So... Um, so you had a really yeah. unique selling your way of selling, and you were almost cutting edge. What was well, NASA's pain point? <laughs> it, was well, so, it was so well. So what was so funny? NASA was the funniest one. I was really young, and now I'm an old fart, so I can say this. But I would say you look there, young still. Just literally, you know, I had to have high, high security clearance. I would walk in a room, and their bidding process was we would sit around this table and there'd be six of us and like most of them, they're all like white men, 60 years old. And here I am, not only female, but digital, you know, which was so freaky to them. None of them were doing any of this. And we would have, they would put, the, the lady would put a project and say, this is what we're bidding on today. And she would give us little tiny squares of paper. We had to write our little price on it, fold it up, put it on the table in front of each other and then she'd unwad them and then someone would win. Well, we were only $15 an hour and these guys had had the accounts forever and they were way, uh, they were terrified. So they were way underbidding us, which was weird, just in these public ones. So if you won the public bid, then kind of public meaning these people around the table, then you would get all this other work. You'd kind of win the work for the month. And right. I, I think I caught on to that, um, you know, for a few months. So they, they were, Nobody in NASA's team had uh, computers or anything. So by the time you know we were done, we actually just kind of let them go because it was just it was just a, a terrible system. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, by the time we were leaving, they were putting the computers in themselves. So the first trans, you know, the first I guess stage of those the design firm and and um, what was the next? You had five transformations. I want you to talk a yeah. little bit about kind of each of those turning points. Well, first, my first thing is we started out as a freelancers. It was just me, Mark. We had little kids under our feet. So our first thing was freelancing. And then, and then we actually uh, became a production house um, where we started to have uh, people come in. And then we uh, did work for clients, but then we also did work for other agencies. There was no agency in town that wanted to do presentations. They were like, ugh, you know, who wants this is like... <laughs> toilet water you know we don't want to be doing this and we loved it and we knew the power of the spoken word we knew that this was a super important vehicle it was like it's like the lingua franca of like business presentations are and so we went from freelancer to an actual production firm and then we actually became a design firm I hired a kind of a famous creative director and she came in and just whipped us into shape and you know, introduce the concept of critiques, introduce the concept of doing multiple rounds of a design. These are, I'd never worked at another firm and really upped our game on the quality of the work that went out the door. And that was when that made a lot of sense to me. We were naturally good at it, at the display of information, but it put creative process into place. That was probably my most painful transition. And then what happened is because we learned all these graphic design techniques, we um, started to do print. We started to web. Uh, we were generalists. We were we were doing everything, um, anything, posters. We were doing big event things, everything, and and still doing presentations. And what happened is the dot com crash happened. 
at the very same time that Jim Collins' Good to Great came out. And um, when the crash happened, what was interesting, everything fell away. Web, print, everything went away. But the phone kept ringing for presentations. Because hmm. if you think about it in an economic downturn, everybody wants all the salespeople to be running around with a great pitch under their arm, right? They want to the, have the best pitch deck in a dark season. And so when Jim Collins' hedgehog concept came out, I, um, where it said do just one thing, if you can be best in the world, do just that one thing, we cut everything out. I trimmed, actually. So in a season where clients are cutting back and the economy is really terrible, then I, it, additionally I cut um, out all these other services. And that was the best thing I ever did. So that, was, that transition was becoming specialists. Um, and then we and then we went into a season where we decided we actually wanted to make the claim that we are best in the world. Yeah. So that transition happened. That's when I came started to come out with the books, come out with um, all these things so we could actually be known. We thought we may be best at it, but we wanted to be known for being best at it. And Inconvenient Truth, stuff like that helped. What was, your, what we was the in, role in Inconvenient Truth for people who don't uh, know? Oh, we um, we helped write and produce Al Gore's slides for about five years before the movie, and then we helped with the uh, graphics in the movie. We didn't produce the movie at all, but we did all the slides and um, helped him with all that. Um, so then I was like, "Wow, we're really good at presentations," but the but I really felt like um, I hadn't seen one that was valuable. I hadn't seen someone deliver a presentation that was really, really amazing. And it was heartbreaking for me. And then that's when I went on my journey through story. I went on a trip to India and I, cause I really wanted to see if my shop could be outsourced. I was scared about that. Cause I was hearing, I was hearing that, you know, McKinsey and Hewlett Packard and all these people were sending their slides and presentations out to India. And it scared me. So I made a trip to India. You have and a I lot realized, of staff. You have a lot, a big company. Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, I, I had, I could have lost a lot of work and I, I went there and I interviewed a lot of people. I met with a lot of companies and I met with like top to top agencies, like top brand agencies from here that are doing work there. And their work wasn't the same caliber that we do here. And there was definitely, um, not the same commitment to the same visual estate. Like I was in the home of princesses and the Maharaja and stuff. And I was like, whoa, they think this is attractive. Like nobody would think it was attractive. We'd all think it was gaudy. But I came back from that trip re realizing that I, I met I met these little girls. We went to the school and they all had these little pink dresses, little black bow ties. And they're all they were all excited to see me. Thousands of little girls. Now these girls are more educated than most of the kids in the United States. And they will not get jobs. They'll probably sweep floors because wow. they were like orphans and stuff. And there were thousands of them. And about 30 of them had prepared a presentation for me. They put in a computer lab and the lab was just walled with computers and they made presentations for me, PowerPoint files, wow. to show me. And I looked at this and it kind of freaked me. I was like, oh my God, not only do these girls want to be me, you know, but this is a workforce I need to contend with. What, you know? So in India now, instead of rows and rows of sewing machines like it used to be, it's rows and rows of computers. And so I came back from this trip like, well, it could be outsourced. Like it really could. So you, did you come back more scared than when you went? I, I came back about as scared as I thought. Yeah. Um, I thought, well, it's not going to happen right away. Because when you talk to anyone in India, little kids, anyone, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a civil engineer or a software engineer. Every single one, every single one of them. They're just now, like a really good friend of mine is helping pioneer an art revolution there. Like they don't value art as a skill. It's all software engineer, civil engineer, all of it. And so I knew that mindset would take maybe five to eight years to break, you know, to switch. Um, so I knew I had time. So I knew it would happen, but I knew I had time. And that's when I came back and said, you know what? The visualization is probably going to go overseas one day, but the content and the story can't. It can't. That, and so that's when I came back and I'm like, that's it. We're getting into story. We're going deeply and we're going to be masters of it. And so that was our storytelling phase. And then right now, we not, we're not, you know, we're adding to the storytelling phase is we want to be persuasion experts. And so we're trying to get a lot of science and proof and persuasion and um, just take things a little different. So just building the, the story is the vehicle for the whatever the persuasion, uh, exactly. which taking it to the next so, level. 
And that's launching more of a consultancy. Good. You know, every company goes through change. I mean, that's what your whole show is about. And we come together and we make our change strategy. Yeah. So we know our change strategy. But you know, people don't ever spend time on the emotional strategy. Yeah. And it's the emotional strategy that's actually going to make it all happen. So that's what we do. We're kind of the sugar coating around the big change pill. Um, and that's kind of what we've been working on. Yeah. And I, you said something about it was you say like you cut certain things out. Yeah. What was something painful that you had to cut out? Because a lot of people maybe right now go, well, I do this, this, and this, and I do get business from all of it, and it's tough yeah. to, to chop things off. How, yeah, what was a painful out, thing? We cut, out, we cut out print, print design, which back then was huge, huge, huge. I'm glad we did because hardly anything gets printed anymore. Not much gets printed, not like it used to. Um, and web, I think, was the harder one. Because I knew that was the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was easy to tell that, you know, print may be going away, but web was hot. And interestingly, we still do um, what you have to as a companion piece. A presentation has a halo effect. There's these other things. Oh, you do this big presentation. You pronounce this great idea. Well, then you have to give people resources to follow up on your idea. Mm -hmm. So we still do some web stuff. In fact, I just, um, I think you saw it. I just released Resonate. Um, for the free, multimedia it, multimedia version. Media, yeah, yeah, and HTML5. So all of those are things that we do here naturally. Mm. But I knew we needed to be known for presentations, and the only way to do that, according to Jim Collins, good to great, is to cut everything else out. That's and tough we did. Thing they do. like suckers on a tree, right? They're like all the other things that you're not best in class at are, are like suckers, and they drain. What was the light bulb moment that you realized the key was in telling stories? Because, I mean, people, yeah. there are presentation companies out there and they may not hone on exactly this. How did you, when did you first realize that? So a big foundation of that was this big insight I had from India was that we got to do the content and I haven't seen anyone do it in a super compelling way. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happened came, I, so much of who I've become have come from personal failures. I don't know. If you know, but I got a C minus in speech communications in college and a D in English, right? So it's like, fail. So I actually had spoken at an event. And um, for years and years, I've been like, if you're familiar with Wizard of Oz, there's the guy behind the curtain making the powerful Oz look awesome. Very comfortable behind the curtain, making other people look amazing, look powerful mm -hmm. and the whole thing. And then one day I was like, you know, I'm the presentation lady. I need to be a, a presenter. Like it's felt hypocritical. And so I kind of came out from behind the curtain, signed myself up to start to speak at um, event, this small kind of risk-free event, a couple hundred people. And what I did is I, each year I signed up for, I think, six years. And I wrote, I, I decided I'm going to pick what would be a chapter in my next book. And it would force me with the deadline or whatever. This was slideology a long time ago. Yeah. And I went to the conference, blah, 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 shared all this information, like blast, blast, blast. And the survey came back and several people said, unbelievably valuable information, hmm. but I feel no connection to Nancy whatsoever. She really should understand the power of story. I was like, wow. what? <laughs> I was mad. I was mad. And then I get like, so I think it maybe comes from my childhood. It's like, well, I'll show them. Fine. <laughs> like, you know, go ahead and poke me in the eye. You know, and then I, I jumped in and I jumped in hard. And, um, what was it? What was it that they feel that they didn't connect with you and now audiences do? What did you switch? I think my delivery style is still the same. I, I exposed myself more. A big part of the end of my TED talk is that. Like it's like mm -hmm. people want to root for someone that's gone through hard times. Right. So what happens in presentations right now is you get up. You want to look perfect. You want to look polished. You want to look like you got it all together, like you have no problems. Right. And and we're all flawed. And I think when people are like, "Oh, he's flawed like me," I, I, you know, I connect to them. It just makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. I remember listening to your TED talk and wanting to hear more. I wanted that part of the the talk to keep going because I wanted to hear more about that. Obviously, that's why I asked you those questions in the beginning. Uh, um, I wanted to also hear about resonate a little bit uh who's resonate for what's one of your favorite stories in resonate so people make sure to check it out resonate rocked my world so resonate is the fruit of my three and a half year journey through story um so i loved writing resonate resonate completely changed me it it completely rocked my world so resonate is for 
anybody who creates content for themselves, for their boss, for their company, especially around the spoken word. Um, because when you resonate, like literally the physics phenomenon of resonance is you send a signal out and if you, if, if you send, if the frequency is the same frequency as the person on the receiving end, they'll be moved. Like literally it'll vibrate, it'll move or whatever. And so I wrote it for mostly professionals that needed to communicate. Now the principles in resonate aren't just for the spoken word. It's also it could be for a blog. It could be for a email. It's important I, for everything. I mean, yeah, we're always I get trying my husband to yeah. do chores for me on the weekend using the principle, <laughs> whatever. But it's a persuasion. It's a, it's a persuasion methodology yeah using the tension and release of story. Yeah. So there's a persuasive story pattern that I found that the greatest communicators have used. And um, it's, it was a discovery, actually, and a shock. I was just stunned um, after studying, you know, hundreds of speeches, of famous, famous speeches, and, you know, 20-some years of stuff on my servers that, you know, I had context for presentations, but to study story and then use that as a filter to study really beautiful, beloved speeches. That's when I made this discovery. So I think um, to your second part of your question, my, my favorite, I think you said my favorite yeah, story. Yeah, your favorite story in Resonate, yeah. In yeah. Resonate. Yeah. Um, gosh, uh, one of my favorite things was um, at the end of the book, I put what's called a coda and a coda is a musical term which means these things are related to the book but um, are tangential in music that's what a coda is it's like that what it is so when I speak and travel people are like when they see this form this discovery that I made they're like wow that reminds me of music classical music the beginning and on end and then I'm like wow you look at the coda section at the book it's got uh, I analyze uh, Mozart's a Mozart sonata because the sonata form has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it goes through exposition. It, it, anyway, so I got to work with my son on that. My son is a very, he's a, actually was, is a music prodigy. Oh, wow. He's a composer, and he took the visualization I did for speeches, and he overlaid it over uh, music. And what, the reason this is my favorite story is he's just genius brain at his music, and I always struggled but when I can see the music now, like you can go and the music plays and then you can see the contrast because that's what great communication is. It has all kinds of contrast in it. I, for the first time, could actually hear classical music. So here's this thing that my son loves that's beloved to him. I didn't, I couldn't understand it yeah. or enjoy for it. For him, it's natural. natural. For him, it's natural. For me, I had to train myself how to hear it. And by seeing it, I could hear it. Hmm. So that's my my story about develop, you know, while I was developing it. Yeah. But my favorite in there has got to be Dr. King, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. And if the audience wants to go look at the Resonate book online, the multimedia version, you can actually hear his own voice. I licensed, cost a freaking fortune to license wow. all the stuff in his voice. You can actually watch my analysis as you hear his voice. That's really cool. And um, so when I wrote Resonate, I actually, in my head, wrote the multimedia version. So as I was writing the book, I was developing all this multimedia stuff in the background. So Dr. King's speech is probably yeah. one of the best. And we'll uh, link up uh, your site, and it's D-U-A-R-T-E dot com, and they can see it right there for now yeah. on there. It's resonate.duarte.com yeah. to go there directly, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to hear, too, I mean, you there's a couple key things that anyone who watches your videos or looks at your site – you know, culture is a huge, very high value. Obviously, coming from a you know a husband and wife team, yeah. you know, having that kind of family atmosphere. But uh, I want to know, and you have hundreds of employees. I want to know what you did wrong from the beginning, and what works, what you found has worked well with hiring and culture. I think in the beginning, I think the culture has been here. I, we have the most committed. You know, when you're in a startup phase. You don't need, nobody's clamoring for job descriptions. They're just in it for the cause. They're excited and all that stuff. And I think your culture kind of starts from the top down. Mm -hmm. So because my husband and I very much respect each other, very much love each other, and tend to be playful and have fun, that definitely influences the whole culture. So that has always been here. 
early on where I failed was as an entrepreneur, you're a generalist. You're, you're pretty good at everything. Like I was really good with clients. I was pretty good with sales. I could concept and storyboard and I could, you know, solve things and I could project manage. I could account manage, you know, I never could do accounting. So don't even dream I could do accounting, but, um, Oh, I'd rather peel my fingernails back <laughs> do that. <laughs> but, um, you can do everything. You can do a lot of everything. And so what happened was I became my own limiting factor and I didn't, I didn't delegate. I didn't hire. I didn't, I didn't push things down. And what happened was my very best friend worked for a major biotech company here and he's watching me just trying to do distressed. everything. I was yeah. just distressed all the time. So my dearest, dearest friend, so he comes in, he starts to, he starts to just observe me working so he can write job descriptions and figure out what is it she's doing and how can I shave these things off. So he writes job descriptions, hires people, and I had to actually like let go of that thing that I was pretty okay at. Yeah. I wasn't awesome at it. And what I did is I, I had to mourn the loss of that role. Like when they stopped me, wanting me to do all the concepting and storyboarding, I wept. Like, but I knew if I didn't grieve it as a death, yeah. I would meddle. I would micromanage. I would tell this other person how to do it. It had to be dead to me in a way yeah. and believe that this person was better at it than I was because I was like the hub to all the spokes right. and it was killing me. Um, that was a huge, huge thing. And he loved me and he would have to tell me, Nancy, you think you're really pretty good at this, but you're not. I think you, and because I knew he loved me and he was doing it's it coming out of from a place of help of affection and yeah. compassion. I don't think anyone else could have been that person at that moment in my life except this man who I knew was, and we're still best friends. We used to call each other and cry. and I mean, we're just super close. And uh, he was the right guy at the right time. And uh, that was a super important pivot time for me. And I think now the staff runs the culture. You know, I heard the CEO of Pepsi, who is my CEO crush. I love Indra Nui. And I heard her speak. And Pepsi has 300,000 employees. Wow. And what happened was um, she was like, who holds the spirit of Pepsi? Who's the culture keeper at Pepsi? And so they did some sort of survey somehow, and uh, the culture itself identified that there were 250 people that actually drive the Pepsi hmm, culture. Really? Like, wow, that's what I did. Huh, God, 250 out of 300,000. How did they even find those people? It was through, like, the, the culture itself identified who they were so Got i don't it. know the process. it kind of led back to certain survey people or yeah. something and she actually spends a day and a half with these people and she actually passed the mantle of the culture on to them hmm. and then she meets with them i mean a day and a half a public figure of a ceo or whatever and i was like wow i think i have 30 culture keepers out of 120 people or whatever it's like it's amazing. my staff owns this culture like hmm. my ratio of of people who have the spirit of Duarte is so much higher. Like we do art gallery openings. There's so many things we do that we don't. Yeah, if you go on your website and you watch some of the the videos under the the team or about page, people yeah. can see that. Yeah. So we just had an art gallery opening and wine tasting last night. We just do so much, and the thing we do that nobody is ever invited to. It's a very private event. We don't. We film it only for ourselves. It's called Speak Up. And it's twice a year. We have eight people tell stories for eight minutes. And I got to tell you, Jeremy, I have in my life, I've never sat through anything like this in my whole life. And because it's so private and, and it's a moment in time that will never happen again. Nobody else can experience it. Mm. And these employees get just raw. Like one of my employees um, was almost murdered by her husband. Like she literally tells the chilling moment Holy when cow. Hand, like moved across her face or whatever. Like we're just like, oh. so I'm sitting there feeling this enormous amount of affection for the presenter, for the storyteller. Right. But then the shocker to me, and here I travel and talk about story, and we've only been doing this for three years. The shocker to me was the bond in the audience, how we all felt connected to each other because we all co-shared in this person's experience. And man, if I could bottle that, I would, yeah. but it's really sacred yeah. and amazing. And those kinds of things knit us. There's the, the best way to knit someone's heart to each other is to create these very communal ceremonial experiences yeah. together. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you say that, but it's, 
um, for someone like that to share that is really difficult. You know, how do oh. you create an open environment enough so someone would even, you, you first of all have to have the event, but then people have to share that stuff. And okay. it's not easy. You wouldn't believe what they share. Like, it's so funny. Like, there'll be eight stories, and I might weep at one no one else weeps at. This person weeps at that one. Right. And then you're crying because you're laughing so hard at that one. And the the culture here, that's just the So culture. how do you foster that openness and vulnerability when it's it's hard? People don't want to be vulnerable. We have um, – I, I wonder if it's going to scale. That kind of keeps me up at night. I would say our core value system here is love. And I wrote, once I figured out, I was like, you know, I think that's our core value system. My first thing I wrote down was, how do you scale love? You know, there's that big Dunbar number that we're pushing up against that says, you know, a culture of 150 or more people starts to mm. fall apart. And then I'm like, do I want to scale? I went into this. My husband and I actually mm. moved to the Bay Area to go into the ministry, believe mm. it or not. We were going to pioneer a church because we thought church was broken. And in some ways, we did that in a sense that we created a community of love. And that's really what we wanted to do. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, there's huge trust. We have, I'll show you. We have a, um, I, we have this um, values. We have, and what's weird is values at a lot of companies are just written on their badge or on the kitchen wall. And, and when new employees come in and then they go through the values thing a year after they've been here usually or, or anywhere from three to six months and they're like, oh my God, I've never been to a company where the values are actually lived. You know, the values at most companies are what you aspire to be, but here it's that you live them. And the values are based on our differences and embracing our differences and um, love actually. It's like love others the way you'd love yourself. It's have a merry heart. It's give your best. And a lot of these are actually based in scripture, which is interesting. I don't, you know, it's not um, evident right away. But um, what we did just a year ago is we made the giraffe. You can see the little giraffes on there. Yeah. We made the giraffe our mascot. We've used giraffes here as a way, as a gift giving. I don't. It's a long story how that started. But the thing about giraffes is. They have a heart five times larger than any other animal. They lift their neck out for each other. No two are alike. Their spots are all different. And and, and what's beautiful is, is, do you know what a herd of giraffes are called? Like a whole herd of them? No. They're called a tower, which I thought was so amazing because that's a sign of strength and unity and coming together and being a strong thing. So we um, live them. We live the values. There's not a lot of hypocrisy. And I think... People start to distance themselves from their cultures when they see hypocrisy or broken promises, stuff like that. And I don't, I don't think we have that here. Yeah. Uh, we have our seasons. We're going through a really hard season right now of change, and then then people start to question, oh, is this our value? You know. Um, but we land back on on the values. It's hard yeah. to make change and be unsettled, and, um, That's true. and everyone be happy about that. Yeah. You know. I mean, I have so many more questions, but I'm going to move on because I have questions about hiring, you know, because I know it, the, the culture also comes from the beginning of who you choose, how you choose yeah. them. It's very hard to get in here. <laughs> and um, I know you have high standards for that. But I also yeah. want to know what have you learned with working with huge companies, um, you know, like Google and GE and yeah. uh, that you take to what you do? I, what was interesting is, you know, I mentioned earlier I dropped out of college. I had one year of college and I just pretended to know what I was doing, right? I read all the latest marketing books, all the strategy books, subscribed to HBR, you know, back when it came printed. I just, you know, all of Booz Allen, Hamilton, all of that. So what happens is these companies, their best, best, best thinking is in PowerPoint. It is in PowerPoint. They write their strategies there. They do. So I would just devour every file that came in. I would just devour it and be like, why did they think this? What are they thinking? Why did they display it this way? What is their mindset? Who are they talking to? Why, you know, and I got, I basically got a, a, more than an MBA just from reading all the files on my server. And then a few years ago, Cisco actually paid for me to get my MBA from UCLA, oh, wow. which was really, really, really nice. So I felt I, it kind of closes a, a hole inside of you when, when you're sitting in these rooms with CEOs telling them what to say. And you're like, I am a fake. I'm a poser. I'm yeah. not qualified to sit here. And so it, it kind of helped, you know, shut off some of the demons in my mind that were 
that were being really mean to me about me not being qualified to be there. So I've, I have learned an enormous amount. Um, my next book is around, you know, that emotional strategy around change. And so as I'm kind of checking it, I'm, I'm, you know, meeting with huge companies and saying, is this thinking sound? Cause I've never worked for a gargantuan sized, highly political company or whatever. And so that's been really interesting. To, How do you yeah. get over that self-talk? Cause you know that, you know, you provide valuable uh, information and advice um, to these companies, but internally you were thinking, you know, you have that self-talk, like you're not good enough and you don't need a UCLA MBA or whatever it is. It's just a piece of paper. You know, you're the same person. How did you get over that yeah, self-talk? It wasn't so much the UCLA paperwork. It was Cisco believing in me enough to pay for it. Gotcha. So to me in my life, there's been these thresholds I cross where I have to ceremonially rejoice in the closure of one season and the beginning of another. And the minute I actually bring closure or there's this something that happens to me or someone says something to me like, you know, my mom leaving me these voicemails, suddenly I'm like, whoa, all my life I said I wanted her to say that. Oh, my God, she just said it. I need to move on, right? You just do these things that close one door and open the next one. Yeah. I want to know also what's the most common mistake people make when telling their story because they may think they're doing a good job, yeah, but they're not. What is a common mistake that people well, listening? Well, there's mistakes should... people make when they're presenting that may be different than mistakes people make when they're telling their own story. Mm -hmm. So since you said story, I'll say what that is around story. Um, when people are telling their own story, I think they um, tend to gloss over the details or gloss over the hardship part. So I think that's why story doesn't get traction in business because we're at business. We want to be promoted. We don't want anyone to think we're flawed, you know, mm. but yeah, I'll tell you, I will, I will follow a flawed leader who admits it before I'll follow one who pretends he's never made a mistake in his life. So what happens with a story is the story has obviously a three act structure. The first act is this likable hero. You get who then the second act is they encounter these terrible roadblocks. And the third act is that they emerge transformed. Mm. So all of us want to be this likable hero. But the part of the story is that you encounter these roadblocks. And people don't, People are afraid to say, I really struggled learning accounting. Or I really don't, didn't know what I was doing. And then I worked and worked and worked and I overcame. You know, People don't want to, they, to your point, they feel exposed when they tell that middle part of the story. Yeah. And they don't want to go there. And sometimes they gloss over it. But it's that struggle that will endear people to you. It's that it's that really raw, heartfelt, yes. I failed, and I did this wrong, I made this and this, this mistake, um, and that's how I became who I am today. That That's amazing to do that, and people are scared to expose themselves because they think they'll be judged. And in reality, yeah. they'll have people form more affection for them and yeah. not judgment. So it is interesting. I want to find out too. We talked about a lot of the challenges, lows. What's your star moment? What's one of your proudest accomplishments? <laughs> um, I think my kids. I mean, my kids are, you know, women especially, women of any sort in the workplace always worry about the scar they're going to leave on their kids for, um, you know, who for working. And it was hard. You know, there were nights where I didn't see them a couple nights in a row, and I would come home and like cry face down in the carpet so they couldn't hear me crying. And I remember one time I cried the night before. I'm having breakfast with my daughter the next day, and I'm like, I cried last night. I was really upset because I wasn't here, and I feel guilty, and I feel like I'm a terrible mom, and you know, the whole thing. Any of the women listening will understand what I'm talking about. And she goes, Mom, I can learn to cook from the Food Network channel. And she goes, but from you, I learned to communicate. And that's a life skill that no one else could teach me, and I'm going to be better. Like, I was just like, oh, you know, I couldn't believe it. And um, they both turned out strong. They both walk in their destiny. And, um, and, and they let me be me. They let me run this thing. They know it's my passion. And, and they've both found their passion that's mm -hmm. a major distraction in their life, too, kind of. And I think that's, that's my star moment, personally. Yeah. They have some of your fiery passion. They do. Yes. Um, I have, uh, we're right at the hour, so I have one last question um, before I, I want you to talk a little about your company. Um, but I wanted to, this is something I was going to ask you before or after, but I figured 
you know, you're talking about vulnerability and everything like that. And um, one thing is I paid so much attention to the questions in the format because it's you and I usually <laughs> do, but I wanted to see what you think I need to improve with my format, oh, wow. my questions. What should I be doing differently? I guess mistakes that I make with this process that we just kind of went through it. Well, um, I, there was a lot of questions. I don't think you even got through them all. No. <laughs> But I've enjoyed I guess, it. I, I guess I what like, mistakes am I making or with this format should I be doing differently? I, I don't I don't know. I don't oh, okay. see anything. I I felt like when I first got the list of questions, I was like, oh my God. Like that's the only thing I think I was like, I'm completely overwhelmed. So I would say what what you did was that I can see the themes that you put in there and you wove them in really well and it felt really conversational. And I think you did a good job. So I don't, I don't know. I think the I'm asking the expert. So I had to, I had to, I had to ask and you could feel you free to tear me. You just wanted me to fawn all over you. No, I actually, <laughs> tear downs are okay too. So No, you did a good job. I think it was good. Um, so I want you to tell people what's new and exciting. What's going on with Duarte now? We are, um, like I said, kind of in another season of transition. Um, we are um, trying to figure out how you organize yourself to position yourself to go global. But we want to kind of redefine what it means to go global, too. So we are uh, writing a couple new books that will, um, every time I write a book, it kind of shapes the shop. Um, we find this cool thing that happens here, and then we explain it to the world, and then more work comes in from that. So I've got a book in January that's releasing called Slide Docs. And, you know, there's the gap between presentations and documents. And so I'm, I'm giving people permission to create documents using PowerPoint or whatever tool you use, but never present it. It, it, it should only be distributed like a document. So that's going to be a really, lo it's lovely. Um, it's a lovely book, but I'm distributing it in PowerPoint for free, which will be fun. Oh, wow. I'm excited about that. But then my next piece of real work, like I would call Resonate a real piece of work. Um, that should be coming out either in the fall or early, early next year. And that's this one about wrapping everything in an emotional strategy. Mm -hmm. So what we did is this is the end of our 25th year. And Congratulations. This next year's our 26th, mm -hmm. right? So this summer we did a series of labs. We did 11 labs. We sat in a room and said, let's reimagine a presentation. In, 20, in the year 20, uh, whatever, it's 25 years from 2013, 38, uh, 2038, what are we going to be doing? Um, how are presentations going to be different? And it was unbelievable, Jeremy, mind blowing. So we have these very futuristic scenarios, but then we have some really things. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to make some software. Oh my gosh, we need to be building this. Like it, it completely blew everyone's mind away. And the energy in the shop, you know, there's a great Daniel Pink TED talk where he said, if you even just give a small percent of people's time to innovate, it's better than a bonus. It's better. We still do bonus our people, but um, he's like, it's better than all of that. And just the wild, crazy energy here around innovating was awesome. So a couple things came out of it. One of them is a stump speech that I'm going to go back to my clients and do this very visionary. Here's where presentations are going in the future. So that's going to be really fun. But now I'm building yet another business model in my own shop because we've got the agency, we have the academy, we have training. And now I've got to build a software development team uh, to come up with all these ideas. And so I just, I used to have to hole away and dream up everything, right? I would, I would, oh, I think my next book should be this and felt a little ivory tire, ivory tower. Like I'm, I'm disconnected and to hear it come from the bottom up and the idea is better than mine. I just feel like I have an innovation engine here that I didn't even recognize. So that's what's, happening here that we're pretty excited about so where can people reach out thank you and check out more uh -huh. so um there's my website's duarte.com with twitter is at nancy duarte and then i do connect to anyone on linkedin that connects with me so i accept connections there All right nancy i appreciate it the last question i had was i know you love stories i want to know what your favorite movies are ah <laughs> my favorite movies Braveheart is up there. Um, believe it or not, we have this family movie that if if we think you and we, if we like you and we think you're kind of cool, and we want to see if you'd fit in our family, 
if you watch this movie and you don't laugh, you probably won't be invited over to the house anymore. <laughs> And it's the dorkiest, weirdest movie, but it's uh, so I married an axe murderer. I don't know. I've seen know. it for sure. Yeah. yeah. So Mike Myers. You have, to, you have to think that one's very, very funny, or you okay. might not fit into our family. Um, so um, Amadeus, I watch every year, every Thanksgiving. We watch Amadeus as a family. Love that movie. Um, so I appreciate it. Nancy, yeah. this has been amazing. You're one of my distant mentors. Uh, so I've followed your work for a long time. So I really appreciate it. And everyone should reach out, thank Nancy, and check out Duarte.com. Thanks, thank Nancy. You.